Hi there, it's Kevin Raber. I'm coming to you from my home in Indianapolis where I've been spending a lot of my time during the pandemic. And I am going to be having another conversations with. And today I'm going to be speaking with my friend, Brooks Jensen. Many of you might know him from Lens Work. And if any of you don't know him, you're gonna know him now and you're gonna be sorry you haven't been subscribing to Lens Work and all the hard work and publications that uh, Brooks Jensen has been doing over the years. Uh, generally, this is probably one of the most knowledgeable men out there in regards to photography, the philosophy of photography, the art of photography, the creativity in photography, um, exceptional where things are. And um, Brooks lives up in the Northwest, and I only say the Northwest now because pretty soon uh, he'll be living everywhere, and um, we'll talk about that in the uh, program here in a minute. Um, but Brooks uh, recently lost his wife, Maureen, one of the nicest women in the world. And many of us that were uh, part of the lens work um, uh, family uh, really are saddened by the, the tragic loss. And um, it's, it was, uh, Maureen was just like everybody's mom. And of course, I think she probably did a lot to keep <laughs> Brooks in order too. So every, everybody, I want you to meet Brooks and we're going to talk about a lot of things today. So we have no formal kind of stuff just because we've always talked about a lot of things when we chat. So Brooks, welcome. Thank you so much for I'm, spending time. I'm with delighted to be here and glad that we can connect via all this wonderful technology. You know, just think about it this way. If we lived 50 years ago, I'd be writing you a letter on paper right now, which you might get in a week. I know. Isn't that mind boggling? I, it is mind boggling. And of course, you know, two, two old guys like us, and we're, we're roughly the same age, give or take a month. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, and I was, I, I'm doing um, a course called 10,000 Hours. Um, you know, obviously, you're familiar with the 10,000 Hour routine. Right. Mm -hmm. And talking a little bit about how my career got started back in 1972. So, I mean, that's 50 damn years I've been doing this now. And of course, I think you'll agree, they were the golden years. You know, there's no cell phones. Uh, I don't, I think FedEx was just beginning to come into play somewhere in there. You know, the fax machine had waxy paper and made all sorts of noise and you're, you know, was, and if people wanted photography, they bought photography. They sent you on assignments and, you know, you got to do some really cool things and you got paid for it. Well, you got paid for it. I never got paid for it. I, you know, I it always cost me money to be a photographer, but that's another story. Yeah, it is depending on the way you. And of course, that doesn't go much different than today. Other than a lot of people don't get paid very well for photography. It's um, you know, it's been quite uh, an interesting uh, transformation um, in in the photographic world. And right now, we're seeing a major one. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, you first and where things are. So, um, when when did you're always been interested in photography, and um, you're not somebody that suffers from gear acquisition syndrome as I do, but and you've taken some amazing photographs. But when did this all begin? How did it start with you? Oh, that's a fun story. Uh, when I was in high school in 1970, I was in an advanced science class and I decided to do a report on, of all things, microscopic protozoa. And I needed to take pictures through the microscope and I quickly realized I didn't know what I was doing relative to photography. So I signed up and took a photography class simultaneously so I could learn to take these pictures through the microscope. In the photography class, I was given a, uh, a book report assignment, you know, typical high school kind of stuff. And I wandered on down to the library and found a copy of a Wynn Bullock book. And uh, I'd heard of Ansel Adams, but I'd never heard of Wynn Bullock. And I looked at his work and that was it. I was hooked. And I've been involved in photography ever since. Matter of fact, my copy of the Photo Lab Index is, is dated 1971. But which, by the way, I'm downsizing. So if you want it, I'll ship it to you. <laughs> That's actually a pretty. You're, you're talking about the old uh, one with the ring binder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old red one from Morgan and Morgan. Yeah, you're a real photographer if you know what the Photo Lab Index is. Which, of course, is totally useless now, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, it, it was so clever, though. I mean, it, um, it was the answer to everything. <laughs> so that's how that's how I got started, and I've been um, doing photography ever since. Matter of fact, when I was a senior in high school in 1972, 
I was invited by the local community college to actually teach some adult night courses in photography. So I've, I've been involved in doing and teaching photography for, well, like you say, 50 plus years now, which hard to believe it's been that long. Yeah, it's kind of cool. You can say half a century. I mean, I graduated in 1972. I went to art school, um, which was funny in its own case, but you, you were not in college for art, were you? No, 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 no. I, I was still pursuing a career in biology. I went to Reed College, and while I was going to college, a, a report came out where they went back and surveyed all the previous Reed College graduates, as many as they could find, to find out how many people were actually employed in something that had remotely to do with their degree. And those who graduated with a biology degree, like 2% of the people were employed with doing something in biology and the rest were like waiters and you know, <laughs> car wash guys. And I thought, you know, this is not a good career choice. So it was either for pursuing money, it was either become a photographer or a poet. And I thought there might be more money in photography, but ultimately I was wrong about that. Yeah, you probably, it's like, <laughs> but you know what? I mean, almost with what you do between writing and photography, you combine a lot of that good stuff. You're, you're an elegant writer. So did you ever do anything in biology before, right after you got out of school? No, 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 I never did. Uh, matter of fact, I, I've been involved in photography uh, ever since. Uh, I got a job working in a camera store, typical sort of thing. It was either that or being a wedding photographer, and I couldn't stand being a wedding photographer. I shot a couple of weddings and said, never again. I hear you. And, uh, but, uh, you know, between camera stores and just doing it on my own, and I had a career in business for a while. Uh, I was the buyer for the ninth largest retailer in the country, a place called Fred Meyer. And I, I was the buyer for the electronics. So I've been involved in, you know, computers and TV games and electronics and recording and stereos and all that kind of stuff, which certainly helps today the way photography's technology has changed because I'm perfectly comfortable in that world. But for me, it's been a more or less a nonstop uh, engagement with photography ever since I first picked up the camera. So with, with your engagement in photography and of course, you know, what you're doing, you, how did this, you know, we, we all have those defining moments. When was your defining moment that you knew where you were heading with this and what turned out to be, you know, for lack of better words, you know, it's going to be your legacy. I mean, lens work and all the associated things that go with it um, are quite incredible. We'll talk about it, just not a magazine anymore, but there's so much more that goes with it. What was that point that drove you to where you are here today? Well, I, like I say, back in the 1970s, when I picked up that Win Bullock book, I knew I was going to have a life in photography. I just didn't know what it was going to be. And in the early 1980s, I was shopping at the local camera store and on the bulletin board, they had a flyer for a workshop. And I thought, you know, that could be interesting because I didn't know anybody. I had no friends who were as passionate about photography as I was. I had library books and, you know, I read everything I could get and Fred Picker newsletters and on and on. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't know any people. And so I called the, the guy who was teaching the workshop, a guy named Stuart Harvey in Portland. And, and I asked him if it might be a way for me to meet some people. And he said, yeah, that's one of the best things that happens in a workshop. So I went to that first workshop and he, matter of fact, he called about a week beforehand and said, Hey, there's a guy who's looking for a ride. We were going down to the Oregon coast. He said, would, would you mind carpooling with this guy? Because he's, he's uh, willing to split the gas, et cetera. I said, sure. That, that guy is Joe Lipka and I've been photographing with him every year now for 35 years. We'd go out for a week in the fall to photograph. So you meet people, you meet friends. The guy I met at the workshop, also a different fellow named David Best, was our best man when Maureen and I got married. So yeah. it, you, you never know. That's one of the things I love about photography is the way it opens up connections with people and places and adventures. And who cares about the prints? Who cares about the photographs? It's the life that is so interesting. You know, it's the people. Um... 
for everybody that touches a camera that has a passion for photography, I think understands this, but it came to light on um, an Antarctica trip we did in 2016. Actually, we were leaving Doc the same day that uh, Trump got elected. And we had 60 some odd people on the boat, all, you know, uh, so it was all photographers. <clears throat> and um, they came from, I think we had 12 countries represented or more. Uh, it was just an amazing group of people. And with all the differences and all the things that there were, you know, in regards to what you believe, what you didn't believe, and different philosophies and governments of countries. And, you know, we had some people from China and Hong Kong and, you know, these a lot of different countries. There is one thread. If you if the whole world would pick up picture, a, a camera and, and embrace photography, I don't know if we'd have half the problems we have today, you know, because it was a, a happy ship. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, connections. I mean, uh, literally tens of thousands of people I've met in my career and friendships that's, that span the globe. And how would you do that if you didn't have a camera? I mean, may maybe there's other ways to do it. I suppose if you're a musician or some other kind of artist, but for me, it happened to be a camera. And matter of fact, that's what led me to Maureen too, and our marriage and our life together, and which eventually led to lens work is we were both photographers. And I've said for years, I was a photographer long before I was a publisher and I'll be a photographer long after lens work is gone. And I'll stop being a photographer when they're throwing dirt in on top of me. You're here. Well, yeah. But they, you know, the cool thing is with the photography, we're leaving a lot of stuff behind. And I know in, in what I've recently done redoing my wills, I've made sure that there's places and pieces, you know, that are going to go to the right places and stuff. Um, so hopefully that will be managed properly as I've, I've asked it to be. We'll see. Anyway, let's let's go into what you met Maureen about. Um, what what year did you meet? Well, that's again a funny story. We we both remember going to a, a meeting of two photography groups. We got together to share prints and having social evening and etc. Like these things happen. We both remember the meeting, but we don't remember each other. A a year later, we bumped into each other and. Uh, we, we liked each other and, uh, went out a few times and, but she lived in Eugene and I lived in Portland and we both had businesses and we're both doing photography and life is busy and complicated. And, and so I, I, I said to her, look, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be, uh, pushy on this, on this deal here, but I, I don't have time to date you long distance for a year and then discover that somehow we've got an incompatibility that what I call the terminal answer. You know, you find out that, that, you know, you want kids and she doesn't or vice versa or something like that. I said, so let's do this. Weird as this sounds, let's go down to the beach for the weekend and spend, we went on a three day weekend, Memorial day. And I said, let's spend three days, trying to kill this relationship by asking every question you can possibly think of, you know, finances, old girlfriends, you name it. I mean, it was Katie bar the bar the door. And we spent three days literally grilling each other on our hopes and desires and wishes and philosophies and on and on and on. And at the end of the three days, I said, well, did you find a terminal answer? And she said, no. And she said, did you find a terminal answer? And I said, no. And she said, well, now what do we do? And I said, well, let's go home to our respective homes and we'll see what happens. And on Thursday, I called her up and I said, I'd like to come down and have dinner with you. And she said, okay. And I drove down to Eugene a couple hours from Portland and, and proposed to her. And she said, yes. And 30 days later, we were married. No, so, you, you didn't even go through a whole year or a month. Or no, no, it was amazing. a matter of months. And shortly after we were married, we were talking about photography. You know, you do. She's a photographer. I'm a photographer. And she asked a really innocent question. She said, well, what magazines do you subscribe to? And I said, well, I don't subscribe to any photography magazines because they're not about photography. They're all about cameras. And fundamentally, I'm, I, I don't care about equipment. I don't care about cameras. I love photographs. 
And she said, well, there isn't a magazine like that. And I said, well, it hasn't been for years. She said, well, what would it look like if, if you were going to subscribe to it? And I said, I, I can not only tell you, I can show you. And I pulled off of my bookshelf one of the early issues of Aperture in the 1950s when Minor White was, mm -hmm. was editing it and whatnot. And I said, Here, here's an early issue of Aperture. And notice that it's all photographs and the occasional poem and sometimes a little haiku or something, you know. But it's, there's nothing in here about equipment or gear or lenses or anything. It's all about photographs. And she said, well, you know, why don't we start a magazine that features the kinds of photography that you like? And I said, well, let me think about it. And the next day we decided we'd do it. And the next day we came up with the work lens work, uh, paying homage as it were to camera work by Alfred Stieglitz. I also had some of those around and showed her those. And so that that's how lens work was born. Little, literally published the first issue nine months after we were married. So we refer to lens work as our baby. Oh, that's cool. So what year was the first edition? Uh, made? 93. 1993. September. So we're going, you know, quite a, quite 30, some, almost 30 years, right? Almost 30 years. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Now, if any of you don't know what lens work is, let me make sure that, uh, of course, there'll be uh, links in the web, but this is this is the Lenswork magazine, and um, ah, the most recent one. Most recent one. I thought I would use the most recent one, so who are at least up to date. Yeah, you, you probably just got it in the mail in the last day or two. Yeah, I did, but um, it's it's first off, it's a different size than any magazine you'll see. There's a few more <laughs> magazines coming online these days, but there isn't a better magazine that I've ever found as far as the printing goes and so forth. I mean. This is a magazine, you know, for, for photographers. And uh, it smells good, too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it really, my wife loves it every time we open the envelope. And she, oh, we got another lens work. Can you, can you, everybody, it just smells so, I mean, it, there's something rich about it. The, the layout, the whole design, um, you know, the, the whole feel for it, the, the size, it, it it's... And it hasn't changed. You've, you always use the same size, right? Well, actually, the first four issues, which have come become quite collectible now because they we only produced a few hundred of them, were eight and a half by eleven. So they they were eight and a half by seventeen, folded and stapled in the middle. And and we we very quickly learned that that wasn't going to work because we were going to go broke. So we went out and bought our own printing press, a little duplicator press, like they print envelopes on, you oh, know, yeah, in, a, yeah. in a quick print shop. Yep. And it wasn't good enough to print photographs. So the very early issues of lens work were all text. They were essays and articles on photography and the creative process. So a, a photography magazine with no pictures, maybe not my best business idea ever, but, <laughs> but the press would only print uh, sheets of paper that were legal size. So we printed them two up and then we had a giant guillotine cutter that we would cut them in half. And so the magazine is eight and a half by seven. And that's why it's that size. Years later, when we went to Ingram for distribution in Barnes and Noble and Borders and et cetera, the people at Ingram said, oh, brilliant marketing. So brilliant because this magazine is smaller than standard size, so that means it has to be put on the front of the shelf. He's so smart. I didn't have the heart to tell him it's because this is the biggest sheet of paper we could print on our press in the in the garage. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, somewhere along the line, you decided to move off to a different press, right? And, and oh, yeah. We, we printed numbers 5 through 11 ourselves and walked around the table collating them sheet by sheet, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we, we wanted to do photographs, but quite honestly, we couldn't figure out what to do with photographs. We didn't want to publish the same old things that all the other magazines published, the, the greatest hits from the great masters. I mean, the, the world does not need a magazine publishing Pepper number 30 again. I mean, it's been published so many times. But it occurred to me that in the workshops that I had attended in my youth, there was, there was a strange experience that was absolutely universal, and that was this. Everybody would bring their prints, and they'd put them up, and there'd be commentary by the instructors and whatnot. And after everybody had had their turn in the hot box and had their work commented on, 
there was invariably one of the photographers would say, I, I have one more thing I'd like to show if I can. It's a portfolio. And they'd pull out a clamshell box, you know, and they'd open it up and it'd have a title and it'd have 10 images or a dozen images or something. And it was a unified theme. Ansel had done these things. Uh, Brett Weston had done these things, et cetera. And a lot of photographers have done it too. But those things never get seen because the magazines all want the greatest hits. The galleries all want the greatest hits. With a dozen images, there's not enough for a book. So we thought that's what we could do at Lenswork is we could publish little portfolios of of 10, 15, 20 images that are intended to be a project, but they're not big enough to be a book. And so starting with uh, number 12 back in whatever that was, 95, 96, something like that, uh, with number 12, we've been publishing portfolios ever since. And to this day, that's still what we do is small portfolios. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, I remember early on uh, reading Len's work that you were very big on developing projects and the, you know, which eventually turns out to be um, a, a portfolio. Um, and I think you influenced me in many ways. Uh, I ended up buying some of the folder covers. Remember what you, those mm -hmm. the covers you had. And mm -hmm. then there was another company you could buy them from Deer Creek or someplace like that. Dane, uh, Dane Creek folio. Dane Creek. <laughs> I don't know why it came up with deer, but Oh, I bought a ton of those things. And, you know, I, they had a window you could put the picture in, and I would always put a title on it. And I made more projects and more mini portfolios uh, using that. And I still do. I still got plenty of them left. And, you know, now that I have a P700 in the basement, I've been printing away and, you know, putting some of these together. I should have gotten one or two out to, to show. You know, I'll put a little picture in the article with it. But, you know, that influenced me so much. And, you know, the portfolios and groups of people, just not an article where some guy talked about fall color or, you know, how to, you know, change something or what film I use. Everything was very artistic. And there were just every issue that, that comes with this magazine just has the most incredible um, different stories in. And I don't know how you do it. So let's talk about this. If, if a photographer wanted to see themselves published in lens work, What's the process? How, how have you picked all these great portfolios and projects throughout the year? And uh, you're on edition, what, 151 right now, I believe? 151. Yeah. Hard to believe. Well, our submission guidelines are on our website at lenswork.com. And people can just uh, go in and see exactly how it is that we want to look at work. We, we typically ask people to send us uh, maybe 30 or 40 images so that we've got enough images to look at and select for a smaller portfolio because we have to think about left and right page combinations which photographers don't they you know publishers have to think about that and so we like to have lots of images to choose from we hope that what they're sending in is thematic that somehow the, the images all hold together as a project most of the time they do every once in a while someone will send in sort of a greatest hits thing and sometimes we publish those but we, we tend to want to do projects but you know here's what's interesting and i'll bet you two bits that i'm, I'm going to talk about you as well as everybody who's listening to this when you go out with your camera and you start making pictures i'll guarantee you don't make one picture and say okay i got something i'm going home you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you're making lots and lots and lots of exposures, particularly now in the world of digital photography. You'll come back from a trip with a few thousand exposures and every one of them's probably perfectly exposed and tax sharp focused because of the technology. So in the old days, we would put those on a contact sheet and then we would look for the best one. And the best one is the one that we would print and mat and frame and hang on the wall like that print that's behind your, your shoulder there. So one image out of all those. And in the film days, that's probably not a bad idea because for me anyway, when I was shooting sheet film, I, I'd work my ass off for four or five days, a weekend, something like that. And I'd maybe come back with a dozen exposures. So to, to pick the best one, 
to print and mat and frame kind of made sense. But when you come back with a thousand, two thousand, three thousand exposures and picking one kind of doesn't make sense anymore. So I think people naturally, because of the technology of digital photography, started thinking in terms of projects. And the minute you start thinking in projects, you learn one of the most interesting things. And that's this. I would put together a folio of a dozen images, let's say, or 15 images, and I would send them out into the world. People would buy them and et cetera. And invariably, I would get back emails. I, I got your portfolio. Love your portfolio. But I have to tell you, that print number one is spectacular. Or another email would say, that print number four is the best. Or print number 10 is the, you know, and it's like, hmm, you don't suppose beauty is in the eye of the beholder, do you? <laughs> and and when you put together a group of 10 or 15 or 20 images and they make a project statement that's more interesting than, gee, I'm a good photographer, see my talent, but they, they really they really address an issue of life and they connect, people will will pick one that's their favorite, but everybody picks a different one. And I realized that when I come back with my contact sheet after a shoot and I say, this is the winner and that's the one I print. Well, that's my opinion. And as the artist, my opinion counts because yes, it's sir. my work and I'm producing it, <laughs> but that may not be the one that connects with someone else that connects with, with some of my audience. And so when you start producing projects in a funny sort of way, it gives people a broader choice to connect. And even though they may not like all the images in the portfolio, they may love the portfolio. And so the connection is even deeper because they found some images that really speak to them. And in the old days, those images that really speak to them might have been stuck on the contact sheet and never seen the light of day because the only one we ever printed was the one that went on the wall. Well, I think that's still true. I, I know if there's one thing this COVID pandemic has done is it's allowed me to go back and look at all my images from exactly. And, and you know, I'm a prolific shooter. I, I've traveled all over the world. You know, in, in the positions and things that I've done in my job, there's not many places I haven't been. And I'm now going back to these, and I call them sessions. Um, I don't know, you know, like whatever the, the word session works. And you know, I look at the four stars, but as I'm going through everything, since I'm looking at the whole batch, you know, I discover an image. It's like, oh, I didn't think that I'd give that a four star. Look at that thing. You know, and then I, you know, throw it up and, you know, finagle it in Capture One. And it's, wow, <laughs> that must have been stupid. Where did I, where did I miss that? So I think one of the, the things that has also been really strong, specifically with, you know, our older shoots is to go back and actually rediscover some of the images that, you know, we kind of pass by for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, I just, I just wrote about that very experience because I've been going through all of my archives and my downsizing process. And, you know, the one, the one thing that, that we never seem to take into account as artists, as photographers is the fact that we are constantly changing. Yes. And so something that we responded to 30 years ago when we photographed it and we picked out the one that was the winner and matted it and put it on the wall is fine. But when we look at that contact sheet that's 30 years old today, we're not looking at it with the same eyes because we're not the same people. And we may see different things, which is a damn good reason to never throw out your contact sheets wow. or delete your digital files because you never know how you're going to think about them. 10, 20, 30 years down the road. And, you know, I, I suppose part of it was, you know, I would look at them in composition, you know, oh, this would be a 1619, or why didn't I ever put that in a one by one or a square kind of uh, composition the first time? Now, look, it, it works so much better, you know, and also because of some of the tools we have, you know, we're, we're, uh, a very, you know, whites and brights and things, you know, I can now tone it with, you know, the high dynamic range that's available in the raw processors and do things that I wasn't quite able to do before, or, you know, the luminosity masking, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the images and the art that I've, I've done uh, and others, I'm sure, are, you know, now all of a sudden it becomes a viable image again. So mm -hmm. it's, well, here's, and here's another example. When I started using Lightroom, I, I, I decided I was going to discipline myself to actually use the keywording. 
which most people don't because oh, they're right. in the rear. Yeah. But I went through and keyworded stuff extensively. I still do it to this day. And I was shocked to find out that I had 890 photographs of chairs. I didn't even know I was interested in chairs. But because my mind tends to think about, I went to this place, I photographed this place, and so I'm going to put together a project of this place. Well, the minute you start looking at your career and looking through your archives and realizing that there might be aesthetic threads that hold together, you find there's all kinds of projects that you've been photographing that you don't even know about because they were being done on a very subconscious basis with the creative muse giving you little hints like photograph that chair and you just do it and then forget about it. Well, that's again, where projects can come from. Well, I have a project that I've been working on and I, I keep promising and telling myself, I think I've got enough to send it to Brooks now. And it's all about being square and double exposure um, things. And ah. it's kind of fun in the sense that, you know, you see something and, you know, you, you, by the way, you tilt the camera, something to do a second exposure, and it's overlaid on top. And by making square, I call it uh, seeing square and seeing double and being square. And um, I think I've got enough to send to you. So somewhere in one campground where you're going to be in the future, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're going to either get a you know a set of files and uh, God, and I'll be biting my fingernails off hoping <laughs> that I don't get a rejected letter. Well, uh, you said something really important there. You said you think you have enough. Well, you know, th we've discovered that that is, that's one of the challenges. Because when we ask for people to send in 40 to 60 images, that, that's a lot. A lot of people don't have 40 to 60 images on a project or a theme. Or if they do, they have, you know, 15 really good ones they like, and then they'll fill out the rest so they can meet the submission guidelines. Well, I, I was thinking about this several years ago, about what does it take to be a project? And it doesn't have to be 40 or 50 images. You could make a nice, sweet little project out of five or six or seven images. About the same time, I happened to stumble across something called a six-word story. Have you ever heard of six-word stories? No, no. Uh, th this is based, there's a whole website about six-word stories. And it's based on, a, on an anecdote about Ernest Hemingway, who was famous for having a very terse, short writing style. And someone uh, challenged him in a bar bet and said, I'll bet you can't write a six word story. And he said, of course I can piece of cake. And the guy says, well, go ahead, do it. I challenge you. And Ernest Hemingway thought for a minute and he said, baby shoes for sale, never worn. <laughs> Isn't that fabulous? Oh, that's, that's great. And so, so uh, based on that apocryphal story, true or not, there's now a website called Six Word Stories where people put together six word stories. And I thought, well, if it's good for that, why couldn't we do something that's very constricted? It kind of reminds me of trying to write a haiku with exactly 17 syllables. So we started a, a project and produced a book called Seeing in Sixes. And the idea was to put together six images on a theme or talk about something about life or whatever that are related as a group, but it has to be exactly six images, not five, not seven. And could we have some fun with that? Well, we had tons of submissions of people uh, trying to put together projects with uh, six images. We were absolutely overwhelmed. The quality was beyond our expectations. So we published a book. We took, uh, what was it? I think 50 of those six, uh, six image projects, Seeing in Sixes, and we published a book. Then we did it again in 2017, again in 2018, and in 2019. So we've now published four of those books that consist of six images exactly. And we're now doing that in lens work too. So we're publishing very short portfolios of five to nine images. And it's all kinds of fun. They're, they're incredible books. I, I've got all of them. And um, um, I mean, yeah, and you, do, you go further than just the books. I mean, that was a brilliant idea. You've done uh, monographs and um, 
I know this this one which you you just sent me. That's an amazing book. Yeah, that's the one we did. Uh, we did this year or last year. Instead of doing another issue of Seeing in Sixes, we decided to do something different because we got feedback from people saying, "I love the sixes, but what do I do with these really spectacular standalone images?" And we thought, you know, we've been pushing projects for almost thirty years. Maybe we ought to give the single outstanding image, a chance to shine. So we put together this book called Our Magnificent Planet, which is uh, basically 300 of people's very best shots chosen out of literally thousands and thousands of images people sent in. Yeah, let's, I mean, just let's, the, the, this is just, look, first off, it's pretty thick and it's chock full of photographs. Um, I try to figure out how to do this so the camera can see it. And, <laughs> but it it's um, black and white and the color and the image and and the the sequencing is just exceptional. This I I've it's just sitting right here next to my chair and I've been enjoying wine and uh, and and looking through it on a, a very slow basis because I like to take it all in. But uh, it's it's extraordinary. So you've done these projects and first off, let me ask you before you go into the projects, the quality and everything you do has a certain look to it. You don't just go use the regular press. You're doing something different with your printing, aren't you? Yeah, uh, we knew we wanted to do Duotone from the very beginning, but it, it's, it's a very tricky thing to do, uh, primarily because Duotone printing cannot be proofed. The only way you can proof a Duotone is to put it on the press and see if it works. And now color, you know, you can get, there's all kinds of color proofs that you can get, but Duotone is trickier. And knowing that up front, we produced through lens work number 42, we produced them as just a uh, half tone printing. But we found a printer who was willing to work with us on the Duotones up in Vancouver, uh, Canada, British Columbia, a really terrific printer. And they allowed us to use their press to make several tests and make a, a perfect calibration for what we wanted in lens work. And of course, because we print every 60 days, we're constantly able to tweak those duotones a little here and a little there and, and refine them relative to the paper and et cetera. So that's the first thing is as far as I know, we're, we're the only periodical in the world that prints uh, with duotone. But on top of that, this printer uses a, a really state-of-the-art technology called stochastic printing. And the short lesson there is that most magazines use what's called halftone printing. And the idea in halftone printing is if you want to make black, for example, you make a really big dot. And if you want to make a medium gray, you make a smaller dot. And if you want to make a white, you make a little teeny tiny dot. So the dot uh, varies in size based on the, the color you're trying to render. And then multiply that out into CMYK for color printing. You can see it's a complex thing. The alternative to that is called stochastic printing and very few printers in the world do it. But this one in Vancouver, Canada does. In stochastic, all the dots are exactly the same size and they're very, very small. There's, the dots are smaller than the size dots used in the best Ansel Adams books, for example, the really top quality museum books. And if they want to make a black area, they print lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little tiny dots. And if they want to make a light area, they print just a few little light dot, but they're all exactly the same size. And that printing is the very state of the art commercial printing and allows us to get black densities that are blacker than gel and silver paper, blacker than inkjet prints. They're absolutely spectacular, a little costly, a little fussy and things can go wrong, but when it's done right, it's the best printing in the world. And that's what we decided we wanted Lenswork to represent with the idea that hopefully it would be good enough that people would want them, want to keep them and have them around instead of just throw them away every issue, you know, like a disposable magazine. Well, and I can tell you, I don't ever throw anything around, but what, you know, my, one of the things that I look for in, in printing, and this is a, a great page to see it. And um, we'll put a, a picture in the, um, 
article a little bit is the fact that Rob DeLoe is thanking you right now for showing his images. <laughs> well, I, I think one of the things in photography for me, and specifically as we've moved into the digital age, um, because we have printers that can print the full tonality of, uh, of uh, you know, zero to 255, is that, you know, you look at a photograph and, and I, I find photographs take me in. If I had a big wall picture, I call it immersive imaging. And, you know, if there's a beautifully printed photograph, like the one on behind me, there has such detail, um, it, it's immersive, meaning you stand away from it, but you see something and you want to go a little closer, a little closer, and you're discovering all along the way as you're getting closer, more surprises. And specifically, that normally happens in the darker areas or the shadow areas of the print. They don't block up. And I think that's one of the beauties about how and why I've always appreciated your magazine is because you get that same impression you know you're not walking but you know you're <laughs> you're doing yeah you're doing this kind of thing with the the magazine and those yeah. two images are pure because there are you can you just don't see this beautiful gray thing and all of a sudden it hits just solid black because the press can't do it you actually see you know more and more and you can get right into the detail until there is pure black or, and and the same goes in reverse you know, uh, on the white side, you know, you just have this beautiful transition, which, you know, you have to stop and look at. And um, I, this is why this magazine, and I know of no others. I mean, I'm, I've there's a couple new magazines that come on the market that have printed really well and bigger. And, you know, I don't think they're as well laid out as what you, you have here. But when you have these kind of black and white images and you you feel the texture you and you you can go in and look at these. I mean, it's something you specialize in, or why everybody likes lens work is because the printing is so good. Each copy is like a National Geographic. You never get rid of them. You know, I, yeah. I've got stacks yeah. of these things, and you know, if you went to <laughs> the occasions, just you know, they're all there. And of course, what's really cool is you know, I love the the side bindings that you, you have where you know they they kind of appear perfectly and you can put them back in order because the numbers at the top and all sorts of stuff that i think is probably something that's always amazed me by your dedication to the quality of the print you just didn't whip off a magazine um, you know you made sure that that magazine had not only good paper and i love the paper selection it's just it's kind of like a burrito paper for lack of better words and, you know the way i look at my prints it is it's a clay coated paper and it's it's meant to hold inks the same way inkjet prints are. As a matter of fact, the inkjet print behind you there, uh, probably off of what Canon or was Epson, off an Epson 9900. Epson 9900. Those printers, all inkjet printers, use the same stochastic printing that we're using, except they're doing it one row at a time, you know, with an ink yep. head going back and forth, where the press does it with printing plates and all that kind of stuff. So that's part of the reason why the, the magazine looks. Uh, well, compares favorably, I'll use that term, with the inkjet prints is because they use essentially the same technology. The other thing that's interesting to think about is the the previous, the halftone printing that most printers use is based on a grid. So imagine a piece of graph paper and you're putting round dots in the middle of that. Well, if you put a round dot in the middle of a piece of graph paper, the corners are still going to be white. Well, that's why the blacks in stochastic printing feel so much blacker and richer and show much more detail is because there's no corners that aren't that aren't covered by ink. If they want to make black, dead black, they just, you know, it, it just uses many, many dots. So the, the point is for me is not the printing technology, although that's fun if you like technology and all that kind of stuff. The point is that I, I think photographers want to have people have as, as, as true a visual experience as they possibly can, whether they're looking at a poster or a book or a magazine or a print on the wall. As photographers, we all want our work to shine. And so whether or not it's a magazine, you know, like lens work or a museum quality book, you want to, have something that you're proud of. And that's why one of the reasons anyway, why we pursue that kind of printing technology is because we want people to be proud of the fact that their work showed up in lens work and, and have that 
continue to be a point of pride in their photographic career for years to come? Well, it's, you know, for all these years that I've been receiving Lenswork Magazine, it's always fun to run out to the mailbox, see the cardboard wrapper. Because of the odd size, you know, it's your lens work. <laughs> you just go home and pull the, the, the pull tab on it and, you know, you see what surprise there is. Now, another thing that you pioneered, um, and I want to talk about two things I think you pioneered in, you know, the PDF and, you know, understanding, uh, you know, that having the PDF and, and being able to, to go to electronic versions of things, you, you were able and, and smart enough to see the future. Unlike, um, you know, a lot of uh, people, you saw the where when PDF came out, and I remember early articles and different things you did that you know you did and started doing a lot, and and you did more than I know anybody did with PDFs. Well, there's there, there's actually two things. It, it, partly it's looking at the future, yes, but it's also partly looking at the present, at the current. We have people who, thanks to the internet, have discovered us from literally all over the world. And we, we actually have subscribers in 73 different countries. But you can imagine that the people who aren't in the United States have to pay a higher price because of the extraordinary cost of postage just to mail them a magazine. And that became prohibitive for some subscribers because it's just too expensive if you live in you know, Europe or something. So we started doing the PDF not just because of looking at the future and the technology and tablets were, you know, way off in the future. Nobody knew about tablets and phones, but we thought it gave people who lived around the globe an opportunity to have lens work without having to pay the penalty of the postage. So it, it was a very pragmatic thing. Of course, once we started producing PDFs, you know, I realized instantly that this is pretty cool because now you've got a true multimedia platform that can be played on virtually any computer or phone or tablet. And so we started including interviews and some videos and all kinds of stuff, hi hyperactive links and, you know, all the things that you can do in a digital format. And what we discovered was two things that surprised us. One is how many people, well, let me back up. We thought people were going to make a choice. They're either going to go for print because they love the smell of ink, or they're going to go for a PDF because they want portability and inexpensive. We've been absolutely shocked how many people get both because they want to have the ink and they want to have the physical book but when they're on the road or they're going to the dentist office or they're whatever, they want to be able to read the magazine. So they subscribe to both. I'm one of your, one of those guys. Yeah. This is something I'm very proud of is um, I've got so many editions here and uh, I'll be doing an article sometime in the very near future about all the publications that I have on here. And what I find this works well for is for me, it's inspiration and it and it's so smooth. You get beautiful text. You still have it looks like a Howard Ross picture, but um it is. It is. I know I know his style anywhere. Yeah. And um I mean you, you, it's still beautiful photography. And the cool thing is you can you know move in and out like this. Um and you also put more pictures in the in electronic version, don't you? Well, we don't have the limitation of the page count. In the physical magazine, we, we were stuck with 96 pages in order to hit budgets and mailing weight requirements and all that kind of stuff. But in a PDF, you know, if a photographer sends us 40 images, we can put a lot more images in. And so we do. That's why we call it lens work extended is because there's more images in that. Brooks has a whole other website, not lenswork.com, but brookjensenart.com. Brooksjensenarts.com, yeah. And he's got some of his publications. And um, I've, I've, I've had some discussions with him about these because these are images that he's taken on his own throughout the years that are just brilliant. There's a, a tool shop uh, portfolio, I think was had something to do with your father or something, if I remember correctly. Grandfather, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and... Just some amazing pictures. And also one of the reasons why I love having it on, on an iPad like this is for me, as I travel so much, I find these things inspirational. And I don't like to go out and copy pictures, but I like to use images as inspirational. Um, 
in the last several weeks, I'm, I'm looking at two forms of, of art that I want to explore further on, on our website, PhotoPXL, and that's LE, which is long exposure, and ICM, which is in, intentional camera movement. And, you know, there's two whole sections of art being developed by photographers that are absolutely amazing with what they've been doing in this, and especially the intentional camera movement ones where they're, you know, long exposure sliding around or, you know, walking around a subject, taking multiple pictures and then layering them in differently. So there, I mean, there's so many, you know, um, parts of this field of photography that, that looks good. So, you know, I use that as an inspiration and some of the people that you featured photographer wise in your publications are, are truly inspirational. And it makes me slow down. Uh, and I know this is an interview to you, but I've got to tell you that because of you, there's a lot of things that as a photographer, I've learned to approach differently from reading the articles and looking at what some of these photographers have done. And, you know, rather than being what I would call um, an intuitional photographer, meaning I snap a lot of things that looks good and things, so a lot of times I now, maybe it's because of my old age, have become more of a contemplative photographer. And so with all these things, contemplative and moving fast and camera movements, long exposures, and just, you know, seeing the shot and learning how light plays on it, what you can do afterwards, it's, you know, truly something to keep us young and motivated and, you know, looking at different ways to, to do things. So um, it's one of the most inspirational publications, you know, out there in the field lens work. And um, thanks. You know, it's, it's so cool. And you've done so much with it in regards to, you know, moving into the PDF formats and, and other things along the way. Yeah. Well, you know, the problem with photography for a long, long time uh, relative to connecting with an audience is, is if you didn't make a print, there was no way to connect with an audience before the internet, obviously. And even if you made a print, I, I always think of, you know, poor Edward Weston back then making these gorgeous prints, who, who, who had a chance to look at them unless you had an exhibition somewhere you know, they're stuck in your closet. And even if you had an exhibition, well, what are you going to show the work to a hundred people who live within 40 miles for 30 days? And then it's, and then it comes down. So the internet has, I think, become a revolutionary thing relative to the distribution of photographic artwork, which is why I started doing uh, my PDF magazine of my personal work, obviously I can't put my personal work in lens work. That'd be sort of, <laughs> sort of tacky and self-serving. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, matter of fact, I've often said I'm the one guy on the planet who can't get published in another photography magazine because I'm, you know, sort of a competitor. <laughs> yeah, so, but you're also the one guy on the planet that, that say, screw it, I'll just make my own books. And you've done well, some beautiful, it, it, beautiful ones, Kokomo, or what, what is it called? Um, it's called Kokoro, which is Japanese for the heart, uh, the heart and the mind uh, when they work together. And so I, I put together these little projects of 10, 20, 15, whatever images, uh, that all deal with the theme and sometimes a little text and I publish them as a PDF and because they're PDFs, I don't have any investment in them relative to cash. So I don't feel any need to charge for them. So that completely eliminates the barrier between my artwork and the public, which I love. I, I love that democratic nature of things. And so there's, Oh, I've forgotten now how many issues of Kokoro there are on my website that people can go. And I, I try to do one every 60 days or so, and they can download them and see some of my artwork. And, I, you know, I get wonderful feedback and connections from people all over the world. Sorry well, I haven't given you feedback because I love, I mean, you know, I love them. I, I probably should just like send a letter to the editor or something. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. And your work, you know, justifies all of what you do. You're, you're, an incredible photographer and you do it without all the fuss and muss and you know having the latest camera and technology you know and so forth you're still shooting with a, what, a panasonic is it or yeah i'm using a g9 these days i'm absolutely loving it with some incredible lenses and I, i'm so grateful that you know we live in this age when all of this technology is so readily available and most of it reasonably affordable except for the a1 
6,500. Well, I've story. got one coming. Well, that's <laughs> so a story, story for another story. <laughs> and a story for another story. Yeah. So, uh, and now that I'm getting ready to head out on the road, you know, I'm real concerned about weight and all of that business. I'm, I'm going to be, well, maybe people know about this if they've been following my uh, podcast and whatnot on lens work, but they may not is uh, because of Maureen's passing last September. I've decided that I'm going to become a full-time RV person. What they, what I'm told in Australia is called a silver nomad. Don't you love that? Oh, I love this. this is going to be such a great nomad. adventure for you. So I bought it. I bought a 30 foot travel trailer. I'm going to be traveling all around the country, photographing, meeting up with people and, uh, enjoying my, my senior years as it were with my camera I had this dream back in the 80s, and I actually bought a pickup and camper and spent months trying to figure out how to build a dark room into the bathroom of the camper, which I never succeeded in doing and ended up selling the pickup and camper. But now with Lightroom and a laptop and a trailer, I can go anywhere and photograph up a storm. And so I'm getting ready to, have that. matter of fact, that's why the studio behind me is looking so empty as I'm, I'm downsizing like crazy, you know, flushing out all kinds of stuff that I don't need, putting it into storage, selling it, etc. And uh, in literally about two weeks from now, I head out. Well, I, I can't wait to this. I've, you, you shared this with me, obviously, you know, a little while ago. What um, I mean, I look at the room behind you and, and remember what that room was filled with. And you have <laughs> walls of books. What, what's happening to all your books? You have one of the biggest book collections I ever saw. Yeah, they're all they're all tucked away in heated storage, and they'll they'll wait for me patiently there while I'm traveling around the country. You know, I, I actually did this in 2013. I, I bought a trailer and I traveled around the country and I taught workshops in I don't know what it was, 20, 20 some odd cities. And, I remember that, yeah. Uh, but because I was primarily teaching workshops, I was constantly on the move. So I didn't have much time to do photography. And But I saw such fantastic country and thought, you know, I've got to come back here someday. So now I'm going to take a more leisurely approach. I'll probably stay in every location at least a couple of weeks so that I can spend lots of time out photographing. Fortunately, because of the technology, it's not going to give me any challenges relative to keeping up with the production schedules on lens work and lens work extended and my assistant, who is uh, uh, not mobile, she'll have all the computer files and everything that we need. So it's it's going to be fun, knock on wood, <laughs> and, and all kinds of an adventure. Well, you're going to learn about how to deal with gray water and black water. and uh, all that's, all I, I got that all gonna... that down, Pat. <laughs> oh, easy. yeah. Anyway, it's going to be great. And, and uh, I do intend to, as we come out of this pandemic, to catch up with you and do some real video, you know, of, of your nomadic life and so forth. You're going to put a, a sign on a trailer or do anything. So we know as you're driving by to honk at you or something. Uh, you know, I thought about that. And then my insurance people said, you should definitely not indicate that this has got camera gear in it. Yeah. And I went, oh, all right. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's just well, a generic trailer. Well, we'll, 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 make sure that the, we have pictures and, uh, you know, we'll put them in here with the video a little bit that we can show and, and share. And I think that's going to be quite the adventure for you. Do you have a, a, a you know, a, a direction and a path planned out, or are you going to kind of just, well, yeah, I'm going to spend the first couple of months working my way down the Washington and Oregon coast, revisiting some places that I want to go back and photograph. Then I'm heading over to Canyonlands in Utah, then up into Wyoming and eventually over to um, to the Black Hills, and that's as far as I have reservations through August. So okay, well, then I'll start winding my way south and spend the winter months where it's not so cold. Nineteen degrees here this morning. Yeah, well, be... we're supposed to get eight below zero by Saturday and Sunday. So oh, I know, I know. That's what we put up with these time of year. You know, it's like you know, you can always be like the carnies. They all park down in Florida during the winter time. <laughs> yeah, well, I you guess I'm going to become a snowbird. And... Uh, you know, you go down and uh, go out in the swamps and uh, take pictures. You, you, you know, you can you'll you'll find good company down there. 
Well, here, here's another interesting thing about the road show that, that again, it's, it's what a fascinating time to be a photographer relative to technology. I want to be able to produce physical prints while I'm on the road. Well, the printers I've had for a number of years now are Epson 4880s. They're huge. It takes two people to move them. I had one for matte paper, one for photo paper, you know, but they're, they're going away. But instead, I'm buying one of these little Epson printers that will do 13 by 19 paper, which is what I need for doing one of my chat books. These are the, the folded and sewn little eight, eight and 10 page books that I do. I'll be able to actually produce those while I'm on the road. Who would have thunk when you and I got started 50 years ago that we would have this technology at our, at our disposal that would allow us to live on the road comfortably, stay connected, you know, publish digitally around the world, still have essentially a printable dark room with us, you know, uh, it's, it's truly amazing. I mean, do you think we can talk on our watches now and make phone calls anywhere in the world from our wrists? Well, uh, don't forget, Edward Weston had to get a Guggenheim grant so that he could go from Western California to Eastern California to photograph. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it, we, we are very, very fortunate. I mean, yeah. you know, I suppose, depending on the way you look at it, as I said earlier in the presentation, you know, I used to think the golden age was when we got paid for pictures and assignments and, you know, I could be doing an inner report work for a week and be in a submarine one week, a coal mine the next, or a steel mill. I mean, one of the beauties about photography is we got to see a lot of things and do a lot of things and be a lot of places. And of course, a lot of that assignment work and everything is, you know, done differently today or it's not being done at all. I, mean, I get in your reports now that don't even have pictures in them. And um, it, so it, it's changed. But the, the means for us to capture pictures, distribute pictures, and work on pictures and do with pictures is, is I don't, I mean, I can't imagine it getting better. I'm trying to be the futurist going, you know, if somebody back in 1972 said, well, your career is going to be end up where you're never going to be using film and you're going to be shooting this on these magnificent cameras that, you know, re make these some remarkable files and you don't use film and you don't use photographic paper and you'll be putting it on this printer that, is so smart that you know every dot knows exactly where to lay ink on, and that's another thing that just mind boggles me. Is these printers? I, know. I mean, I how know. does it know how to do this, swiping back and forth, and just putting the right ink out at the right time and staying in sync every time I make a print and watch it come out? I'm going like, oh, we like a moly! I can't believe this. Yeah, and you know, yeah. so I mean, we're in such a technology age, and now you know you could be shooting on the edge of the Grand Canyon and. Uh, take a shot and say, oh, I think I'm just going to use my mobile phone for a picture. And I, I got to tell Kevin I'm here. And within a yeah. second, you know, I'll be texting you back and on you, I know. bugger you. I can't believe you're there. And you're looking at that beautiful light and I'm not. So, I mean, think about that. It's just anywhere in the world. But here's the really interesting thing. Yes. The technology is mind boggling. Yes. I don't understand how it works and it, and it just blows me away. Just like it does you. But what a bunch of fascinating tools we have to become artists. And if, if you think of yourself as a photographer, that is to say someone who plays with cameras and printers and all that, that's one thing. But these tools exist to allow us to become true artists in terms of personal expression and the distribution of our work in ways that never existed. Poor poor Jackson having to, you know, haul around that, that tent and all of those chemicals so that he could make a picture of the landscape. And then the plate, the glass plate would break on the way home, you know, <laughs> but yet we can make this artwork and share it and make connections with people all over the world. Th that's what it's all about. And 50 or 100 years from now, no one will know or care about the technological wonders that you and I are aghast at. It just mind-boggling stuff. But they'll remember if we did something interesting and important with it. And if we made artwork that's worthy, then the technology has served us well. That's the, 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 that's the big trick. First, I think about those guys with the tents and the glass plates. And so you know, after a day of shooting, they probably went to the bar and sat down with a guy and go, God, can you believe it? We're making pictures on these glass plates. And we wouldn't have been able to do that 10 years ago. And, you know, I can show you what, 
I can, I've, I've got a moment in history. I shot it. I'm like, <laughs> so, you know, I think we've been awed by everything throughout all our years. I remember the first Cedar Chrome print I made with big rubber gloves on and, you know, warnings and, you know, all the things that the, you know, have gone and, you know, been part of the evolution to get to where we're going today. Um, truly a fascinating journey. And I want to, I've, I can't imagine going anywhere else. Um, well, you just got your copy of Lenswork number 151, so you probably haven't had a chance to read my editor's comments yet. But, but yet. in that editor's comments, I, I'm, I'm talking about the downsizing and whatnot that I'm doing as I prepare for this new life on the road. One of the things that I stumbled across in a filing cabinet were all of my printing notes from my gelatin silver days, how I dodged and burned and how many seconds and which area and which dodge and burn tool I used. And I kept all those notes meticulously because I thought, you know, if I ever have to go back and make another print, these notes will be helpful. It never dawned on me that the paper that I used and the chemicals that I used and the enlarger that I used would no longer be pertinent because the technology would have changed so much. But in thinking about that, I realized that probably every generation of photographers could say the same thing because I can't identify a single generation in the history of photography where the technology has not radically changed during their lifetime. Sure. You know, think about Maybe. Ansel Adams making those Parmelian prints in his youth. And then eventually along comes gelatin silver and everybody goes, wow, this is it. No more platinum palladium, no more parmelian prints. Let's use gelatin silver to make contact prints. And then, oh my God, we can make enlargements. Yes. Like <laughs> you think about it. I mean, you know, then there's film types and, you know, e ease of development and new film technology, you know, with, you know, tea grains and all the things that we've experienced. We should probably just assume that whatever technology we're using today that we're all excited about is going to be absolutely quaint and obsolete and an alternative process in about 20 or 30 years, if not sooner. Yeah. Part but of me art, worries. But art stays the same. Yes, it does. That's what's so interesting. Part of me worries, and maybe we'll, we can do this uh, another talk sometime on the road around a campfire eating baked beans or something. Um <laughs> is, you know, where we're going to, you know, we're in a swipe photography society today. I mean, you know, you've got to make images that are good enough that as you're swiping, you know, makes you stop and look at it. But, you know, I think there's a, a whole lot more of things in regards to that. There's so many people taking good pictures. And one of the things more than anything else that bothers me, and of course, you know, I'm an advocate for this, is, you know, putting that picture on a piece of paper and making sure it's preserved forever. For example, you know, my... Um, son-in-law, uh, he's um, an avid photographer photographing his family growing up and mostly done with the mobile phone. And, you know, all their images, uh, you know, go to the cloud, I hope. Um, and, you know, every now and then if they get a good one, you know, they send one to my wife and, you know, she's got the grandkids and, you know, a moment in photography, they put it up on Facebook and so forth. But, you know, where we used to worry about having boxes of prints, now there is no box of prints, you know, there, if something happened to the cloud or something, I worry about where the legacy of photography would be 100, 200 years from now of people that have their stuff, you know, on a file that, you know, they died and, you know, uh, the family didn't decide to do anything. And they just said, oh, these hard drives, they could probably get 50 bucks for them down at the store. Or they just throw them out. You know, there's going to be people's lifetimes of, of work and, you know, these things thrown out and gotten rid of and, uh, unlike having drawers and drawers of prints and things that like, you know, magazines, at least that have your work preserved on them. Um, that I think is one of the things that worries me about the most is, you know, not whether you put ink down on a piece of paper and it's archival and it stick around, which you know, I think we're at a point where that, you know, there's pretty good lifetime on the prints, but all the pictures that are in the clouds and on devices that will never see a piece of paper. This may not be persuasive, but it is, for, well, for you, but it is for me, and that's this. I, I've talked to archivists, not f not people who are worried about asset-free materials, people who are concerned about preserving things for future generations. And without exception, they all say that the most important thing you can do to preserve anything is to have multiple copies. 
if you have a single copy of something, the chances of it surviving drops to almost zero. So in that regard, the digital world is probably more secure for the future than the paper print world is because of all the multiple copies that you, when you share that around with the family, now all of a sudden there's however many, how big your family is, there's that many copies of those photographs. Yes, hard drives are going to come and go. Yes, aren't you glad your your family archives aren't on a zip drive right now? But, <laughs> got, a, got a stack of those. Yeah, but the point is digital files can be so easily duplicated and sent around. Look at it this way. Let's say you've got a print of your grandparents, but your grandparents had five children, and those five children had five children, or et cetera. You know, what are you going to do with the one print you have of your grandparents? That's where it's going to get lost because you're going to have a whole bunch of people in that family chain who aren't going to have that picture, whereas digitally, they'll all have that picture, or at least they can all have that picture, and they can preserve it. So when zip drives go out, you can copy it over to a CD, and when CDs are no longer available, you can put it up in the cloud, and when the cloud's no longer available, you can put it somewhere else. If it's important, it'll survive, and the multiple copies is the, is the best possible way to preserve it. So I, I like prints. Uh, you know, I, I make prints of not only artwork but my family snapshots, but for, but for the future, what I do is I preserve all those digital files in multiple locations so that I increase the odds that they'll survive. Yeah, I've got the survivability part done, you know, um, you know, duplicate drives at two different locations and things like that. So um, they'll survive. I just hope that, you know, when I'm gone, they don't decide, well, I can't use this and they don't take toss it or something. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. It's just one of those paranoia things that I worry about, you know, and, um, you know, it's and also a statement of our age, you know, we're both of the age when, you know, the print was the thing and it still is to me, but it's, it's, and it's hard to let go of that. Yeah, it is. But I don't know that future generations are going to feel the same way. Of course, I'm not, not going to be But printing around. is getting so much easier these days, like with the new Epson printers and, you know, the layout and everything, you don't have to figure out a lot of the dialogue boxes. I mean, we're, we're making pretty good prints. It's, it's kind of like the old TV that, you know, used to have all the dials to adjust color and brightness and tint. And now you just go to Costco and you plug the TV in and it's perfect, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, technology. This is a, an amazing journey. I mean, you know, it's it's. I, I sit here and I look at the smile on your face, and um, <laughs> you know, we both go back so far and have had so many, so much fun. And you know, even in our different aspects of our photography, you know, I've got a website, you've got yours. And by the way, thank you very, very much. Um, for those folks that don't know, as I started putting PXL together, I've spent uh, numerous hours on the phone. Um, talking to Brooks in regards to what I could possibly do, what would work, what, where should we go? This is my idea. And there are quite a few people that helped me develop the path that we're on. And, you know, we've been quite successful with it. So, you know, Brooks, this is my formal yeah. thank you to you. And yeah. um, okay, we're, we're going into happy, membership. Happy to help. It looks great. Thanks. And we're going into membership level soon. And we got a lot of more content. I kind of feel like we wasted a year of some of the video content that we wanted to put together just with the difficulty of, putting people in the same room and doing some of those projects. But uh, right. hopefully coming out of this year and uh, the following year, we're going to be super, super busy. And so uh, luckily I still have my good health and I can do that. And it's going to be quite fun. I hope I can include uh, you in more of it. I hope to get my portfolio off to you and uh, see, what, get a rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, just keep going and enjoying photography. I do this yeah. and have been doing it like you since 72. And we do it for one reason. It, you know, it sits here in our heart. I mean, it's, it's a passion. Um, and the, the cool thing about photography is it can be done and, and it can be with you anywhere, anytime. You know, um, as long as you have a camera, and most of us have cameras on us these days. I don't care if it's um, an iPhone or not. And um, you, you, you just find these great moments. Um, 
Uh, and even if we don't have a camera with us, we can still be involved in the creative life. And th that's the guiding thought between that, uh, that little video thing that I'm doing now for the last couple of years called Here's a Thought. Every day, it's a two to three minute, just a thought about photography. It, you don't have to be out making pictures. You don't have to be printing. You can be looking, you can be thinking, you can be planning and... You know, that's part of the fun of photography is it can be a part of your your daily existence. I love your, that. Your podcast that you do and, and you know, the, the, the daily thought. I mean, I, I put those in the car or right now. I have the latest batch downloaded um, on my hard drive, and it's just uh, easy to, to sit here and, and listen to them. And uh, sometimes they're like, Wow, where did that come out of it? Where did that come from? But they're always so relevant, and you know they're they're uh, great to, to hear. And uh, all of you, you know, in in the article below, you'll you'll it, it, that this video is embedded in, um, and also below in the contents of the the video itself, since it'll be on YouTube, um, will be some links back to uh, Brooks his personal site and uh, Brooks Jensen Arts, and then uh, Lens Work. And please, you know, head over there. There's a there's not just Lenswork Magazine, there's publications, there's um, audio, there's some video. I mean, there's, there's just some great stuff and you know, it'll keep you busy. If you're a passionate photographer these days, you, know, you won't find a better resource. One of them, there may be PXL, who are great, yeah. <laughs> great, great inspiration and you know, the joy of photography that we all uh, get from it. And um, I am very, very privileged to call Brooks a friend for all these years and been involved with so many things with Brooks um, together um, over these times um, that I just want to say a great big thank you. I feel very, very sorry that uh, Maureen's no longer with us, but I know on your journey, she's going to be up there and she's going to make sure that the light is oh, reflected yeah. into your scenes and where you want to be the right way. So, yeah, you know, she'll, she'll always be there. And, you know, as I do sometimes when my mom and dad and others, I just look up in the air when I just wait for the light and it's just like, holy cow, I can't recreate this moment. And then you kind of just say, thank you, you know, and, uh, I know you'll be doing a lot of that while you're out there. Yeah, she'll be so, traveling with me. That's for sure. That's Although for sure. next time, Kevin, we do this, we've got to coordinate our shirts a little better. <laughs> Isn't that pretty ridiculous? <laughs> uh, you know, I, mean, I said, oh, I'll put a logo t-shirt on or do something like that. And I said, ah, I think, you know, I just want to put my, you know, L bean or whatever shirt this is. And yeah, you know, cause I feel comfortable yeah. in it, but you know, oh, there you go. our there mindset, you go. it's like <laughs> it's where we are today. So Brooks, well, it's always good talking with you. Anyway, I've had very memorable moments with you. I know there's a bunch more to come. I can't wait to find you on the road somewhere. Um, you know, so we'll have to coordinate uh, along that because I do think I'm going to be doing a lot of driving to different locations over the, the coming months, uh, especially now that I'm going to have my vaccine. It's like, yeah, I am free. Yeah. I I I'll, I'll keep you posted to where I am, and I'm sure we'll connect somewhere. Are you going to be doing that on the web, like a map, or are you going to be do a, a blog, you know, or what do you have planned for that? A lot of people are asking if I'm going to do something like that, and you know, it makes sense that I should, but it just hasn't coalesced in my mind what might work. I mean, I'm still going to keep doing the "Here's a Thought" videos, and I'm still going to be doing the podcasts, and I'm still going to be doing the "Those Who Inspire Me" and why, and all the other things that are on Lenswork Online. And to add one more thing, I worry about saturation overload but on the other hand people want to know where i'm going to be so yeah we I, do i mean i'll look, figure look out this something. way it could be worth a couple free dinners and you know beers <laughs> and everything else i love it that's great i, I know if you came and said i'm coming to indianapolis i'd be like jeez really no nope, nobody comes to indianapolis <laughs> park in my driveway we'll grill steaks every night and go out and do something fun well, you know, one of the things that I'm really dedicated to doing is not going to all the tourist destinations. I'm, I'm not going to Yosemite. I'm not going to Yellowstone. You know, I, I'm going to go to places that I think are, there's lots of interesting photography to be done, but but no one seems to go there except local people. And I want to connect with them and see what they're doing and Perfect. look at their photographs and have some fun. So. We could go on and on as we normally would and, and can, but to, we got to give um, our listeners and viewers an opportunity to uh, call it quits and look forward to something else that might come their way in the very near future. So, 
for all the readers out there at Photo PXL, I want to say thank you for being part of this family. It's growing and it's doing very nicely. Thank you very much and appreciate your loyalty. And I hope you enjoy the content that we're putting up. It's a wide variety of a lot of different things. And uh, we've got a lot planned uh, for the future. And it's just a matter of resources and time, which I don't know how Brooks does it because he seems to produce a lot more than I can produce. But he, you know, he's got the magic. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Don't forget, we're here at Photo PXL, hoping enhance your vision. Take care, everybody, and thanks.